Hello, church. It is an honor to be here with you to speak to you today. Uh, before we get started, I would like to say a quick prayer. I know we just did, but you can't talk to God enough. So bow your head, please. Dear God, thank you so much for the opportunity to come here today, Lord. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us the gift to be able to be together. Lord, help our, our faith to grow. Help us to find ways to make it grow. Lord, give me the words to speak. Let me say the words you need to hear, that people need to hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So the idea of this, this talk came uh, this summer when we were on vacation. And um, the title of it, I didn't have a title, Terry, when you asked me. I, I did not have it. Um, but it, it's the shoulders of giants. And it was a saying by Sir Isaac Newton um, in a letter he wrote back in 1675. And it was something that I wrote in a card. It was either a Father's Day card or a birthday card that I wrote to my dad. And the saying was, if I have seen further than others, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. If I've seen further than others, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. Isaac Newton, a very smart man. Isaac Newton formulated laws of motion. He had universal gravitation. He developed the bases and the avenues of thought that eventually led to the atomic bomb. So way back in 1600s, Isaac Newton was doing something that affected us today. It affected our way of life. So what does it mean to stand on the shoulders of giants? Well, that means that somebody before you did something really good, and then they grabbed you, and they put you up on their shoulders so that you could see. They made it possible for you to know something that they already know. They helped you along the way. Somebody did that for you. So this all started about with three questions I had to ask. And those three questions. Number one, who taught you your faith? Who's responsible for the cornerstone for building your faith? Number two, who sustains your faith this very day? And number three, who are you sharing your faith with? So we'll go to the first one. Who taught you your faith? It's so one thing we know, there must be a foundation. Anything you build, there has to be a solid foundation. You build a house, you got to have footings. You got to have pillars. You got to have something so that that house will stand. Matthew 16, 15 through 18, Jesus is talking with his disciples and he said, who do the people say that I am? And the disciples said, well, they say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah and some say you're Jeremiah. So then Jesus said, well, who do you say that I am? Well, what about you? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. So there has to be a firm foundation. There has to be. Where did Peter get the right to have the church built on him. Well, Jesus tells us, it was not revealed to you through flesh and blood. You believed it, Peter. You had faith, Peter. Your faith is the reason that the church will be built on you. And what is important is in that last bit of 18, the gates of Hades will not prevail against the church. It's a foreshadowing. Jesus is telling us what's going to happen. Things may get dark. It may be bad, but the gates of hell will not prevail. In the Battle of the Bulge, it looked dark when Bastogon got surrounded. The 101st Airborne was, was completely engulfed. But the fog lifted, the supplies came in, and we know what happened. So the gates of hell will not prevail. It may look bad. So who taught you your faith? Where did you get your faith from? Think about that. Come up with a few names. With me, it was my mother and my father. It was my grandfather who was a preacher. They laid the foundation for the faith that I have today. That's where it came from. 
There was a lady in my church that I grew up in, Joyce Peace, when I got older. And our church had went through some trouble. We lost one of our um, youth Sunday school teachers. And they came to us and said, who would you like to be your church, your Sunday school teacher? We said we wanted Joy Joyce Peace. Joyce Peace is a wonderful lady. Her husband was a deacon, uh, pillars of the church. Joyce was such a soft-spoken woman. She never got excited. She was so soft-spoken. You would have never thought that we would have chosen Joyce Peace, but that's who we wanted because Joyce Peace showed and lived the faith. The members of the church that I grew up in, they helped build that faith. That's where I got my faith. <clears throat> Second Timothy three fourteen through 15. But as for you, continue what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it. Continue what you've learned because you know and you trust the people that you learned it from. It's coming from a reliable source. 15, and how from inf infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through Jesus Christ. Continue what you've been taught and trust the people that have taught you, those people that have laid your foundation. They're teaching you right, continue in it. So why do we have to have a good foundation, that solid rock for our faith? Why do we need that? Why do we need it? Well, we find out that somebody's prowling around. Somebody's ready to devour us, right? Somebody's waiting to kill and destroy us. Matthew 7, 24 through 25. And this is Jesus talking. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. There's that solid foundation. The rain came, the streams rose, the winds blew, and it beat against the house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on a rock. Now think about it. When you're a kid, when you were a child, when I grew up, I thought everybody in the world was a Christian because that's who my parents surrounded me with. We were in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday. The doors were open. We were there. I thought everybody was a Christian. When I went to grammar school or elementary school, we had Christmas parties. We prayed in the morning. We said the Pledge of Allegiance, then we prayed. We had Christmas parties. We had Easter egg hunts. Our teachers taught us and talked about God. So I just thought everybody was a Christian. I didn't realize that it wasn't that way. So what's the significance of that verse? <coughs> the rain comes, will come down, the streams rise, the winds will blow. And they'll beat against your house. What's that got to do with me? I'm a person. I'm not a house. The Bible says your body is a temple. A temple is a building. It's a building. It's a house for the Holy Spirit. As we grow older, I've got a nine-year-old daughter right now. It, it's kind of easy. It's kind of easy. I know the time's going to come at 15, 16 years old. Um, hopefully she's as good as Katie is. There's going to be some attitude change. But what is she going to face? There's going to be bad times in store for her, right? There's going to be people want her to drink, do drugs. There's going to be some, some other bad things that come about. She's going to be assaulted. She's going to be assailed by the devil. He's going to be throwing those flaming darts at her. He's going to try to break her house down. So it's our responsibility as parents to give her a solid foundation. We have got to build that solid foundation for our daughter. God tells us, or Jesus is talking to us there and says, the house will not fall if you build it on a firm foundation. If we have a solid rock to stand on, we've got a place to fight from. Let me say that again. If we've got a solid rock to stand on, then we've got something we can fight on. Right. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. If you stand anywhere else except on this Bible and with faith in God, you're doomed to fail. You are doomed to fail. That's why that foundation is so important. 
The second question, who sustains your faith? Who keeps your faith going? Who helps build your faith? Because that's what we should look for, right? As a Christian, the number one thing that I look at in, a, in anybody that wants to be a friend, are you a Christian? Are you going to help grow my faith? Can I help you grow your faith? One of the uh, a saying that came out, I still remember where I was when Columbine happened. I was at Kenworth Park. I had just left school. I was going to play uh, softball, and some friends told me about it. Um, I was a teacher, so it was an awful thing. And I can remember something that was said by an unlikely source, Eminem, the, the rapper. Not, I'm not a big fan of his music. I just remember some, somebody had asked him something about Columbine, and he said it was a shame that those kids felt that way they were picked on. And Eminem said, I don't care if you're white, black, if you're from here or not. If you're nice to me, I'll be nice to you. And that kind of forms the basis of it. But as Christians, we want to put a little bit more in there. Who helps you grow your faith? Hopefully it's those Christian people that you surround yourself with. For example, members of New Covenant Methodist Church. My faith has never been stronger than it has been the past two years. The past two years have been unbelievable growth in my faith and for me because of the members of this church, because of the members of the Bible study group, the men's Bible study. Uh, Wednesday night, I, I brought we got into something deep, and I still don't understand it. I'm trying to. I've been reading. But I asked, I said, wait a minute, I don't, I don't get this. I don't understand. But we're trying to help each other. We're trying to help each other along to be godly men. Another way my faith is sustained in that men's group is being rebuked. Dale got me one day about two and a half months ago. And, and I'll never forget it, Dale. I'll never will because it started, it started what was to be one of the greatest things that ever happened. But that men's group, when you get rebuked, it's a good thing. It can be a good thing. It changed my life. The godly people that I am with at school now, two, two guys have come in to coach, and they are godly men, and it is wonderful to be surrounded by godly men. I am now, at 50 years old, back to the point when I was 5 through 18 growing up, I'm surrounded by godly people. Not everybody, but most of the people I'm with are godly people. We all have that like mind. So who in your life sustains your faith? Do you seek them out? Do you want to be around them? Do you, do you long to be with these people? Do you make excuses to go see them or call them or text them? Every day, every day, my wife and I get a text from Wes. And it's awesome. Because And it's every day. It's a magnificent Monday. Hope you have a terrific Tuesday. Have a wonderful Wednesday. I can't remember what the Thursday one was. But by 8.30, 8.45, if Katie hasn't gotten that text, she'll text me. Have you heard from Wes yet? He hasn't texted me. Where's Wes? <laughs> yeah, he's already texted me, honey. You must be down on the list a little bit lower than that. <laughs> um, but we look forward to that. That's a member of our church that says, I love you. That's Wes saying, I love you. I care for you. And that's a wonderful thing to have that happen. That helps sustain our faith. Good Christian fellowship. Doesn't that sustain your faith? Just good, clean Christian fellowship. Isn't it good to be here? We go back there and we pray. And I don't get to do it every, every Sunday, but when we go back there, we pray. I would suggest to you when you come to church one day, just sit off to the side. Don't, don't talk. Just get off to the side and listen to other people. Because the same thing is said just about every week. Do you hear the joy out there? Do you hear the joy in the people's uh, voices? Do you see it in their faces when they hug each other and shake hands, tell you I love you? Reminded of that uh, Louis Armstrong song, What a Wonderful World. What a Wonderful Church. What a wonderful group of people. We're happy. We're happy to be here. <clears throat> so how does our faith get sustained? Well, Christian fellowship, one. Colossians 1, 16 through 17. 
For in Him, in God, all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things and in all things, and in Him all things hold together. What happens if you take God out of something? What happens? Can you have a marriage with, that's not based in God? You can. There, there have been atheists who have been married, and they've had 60, 70 years together. They've lived a wonderful life together. But was it as good as it could be? Was that marriage as good as it could be without God? As Christians, there's no way. There's no way it was. If you take God out of something, it falls apart. Mark has said it several times. Are we better now than what we've went through than if we had stayed? I'm not. My faith is stronger. My love for my wife and my family is more. My love for my church is more. My desire to seek God is, is unbelievable. Nothing is as good as it could be if you take God out of it. Milk is great. You put Hershey syrup in it, it is so much better. It is so much better. Nothing is as good as it could be without God. <clears throat> God tells us we need other Christians in our lives. Why do we need other Christians? For friendship, for companionship for sanctification, and for support. We need these things. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just in fact, as you have been doing. Build each other up. Now, that doesn't mean when somebody walks in, hey, that's a beautiful dress you have on. That's a fantastic hat you've got. That's kind of what it is. It makes them feel good about it. It makes you look good. But encourage each other. But encourage each other for what? Towards God. Make each other holy. Help each other be holy. I cannot think that men's group enough. That day we were in there and we circled up and we got that prayer together. And the prayer was, it wasn't, uh, Lord, help Tyler do what he's supposed to do. The prayer was, Lord, show Tyler what he has to do. Show Tyler what he needs to do. Reveal it to him. And that's what happened. That men's group changed my life that day. Completely changed me. If we're going to have a strong and growing faith, we have to share that faith with others. We have to. We can have all the faith in the world, but if we're not showing it to other people and sharing it, what good is it? What good is that faith? <coughs> we have to make our faith better. We have to. We have to make it stronger more deeply rooted in Christ. The parable of the four seeds, one of them falls on the concrete, it, it dies. One of them falls, I don't remember everything, but one of them falls and it doesn't grow the roots. It grows for a little bit, but it dies. But then there's that last one that gets watered and it gets really deep roots and that seed grows. We have to be that last one. Well, what do we know about any garden that's, that's planted? You got to water it. You got to water it. You got to fertilize it if you want it good. That'll help it. The Bible's our fertilizer. Our fellow Christians, our brothers and sisters here, we can help each other grow. Our faith is fantastic if it grows. If you don't use your faith, you just may lose your faith. I think every coach that's ever coached has said that to a kid, and no matter what the sport is, if you don't use it, you're going to lose it. The third question, with whom do you share your faith? With whom do you share your faith? The Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And with that authority, here's what you need to do, Christians. Go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything that I have commanded. 
and surely I'm with you even until the end of the earth. I was watching a um, video on Billy Graham, a, a sermon he was given, and I never thought about this. Billy Graham said this, when you become a Christian, you are called into a ministry for Jesus. Not necessarily the ministry. You may not be called to be a preacher. But when you become a preacher, you're called into a ministry. And there it is in the Bible. Go into all the nations. Teach them about God. We have a job to do. If we're a Christian, there's something we're supposed to do. We have to tell others. We have to show others. This means that in my workplace, in your workplace, would people know that you're a Christian? Is there enough evidence to convict you of being a Christian? In the grocery store, what about that angry driver that cuts you off and then flips you off? We're supposed to share our uh, religion with them in some way. Sometimes it just means we don't you know, give them the one-finger salute or we don't yell back at them. Maybe that's the way it is. But we're supposed to share that faith with that person. Now, I'm the world's worst to talk about driving and being patient. It, of course, my, my dad's here. He may be worse than I am. But we have to be we have to be Christ like. Deuteronomy six, six through seven. Remember, who do we share our faith with? These commandments that I give you today are to be on your heart. Impress them on your children. Don't show it to them. Don't talk to them. Don't allude to it. Impress it upon your children. Talk about these commandments when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Teach your kids. Parents, we have a duty and a responsibility. We have to teach our kids about God. We have to teach the gospel to them. Why do we teach it to them? Because they have to have that strong foundation. The devil's going to be throwing those arrows at them. They've got to have that shield of faith. I just made that connection that today they're going to learn about the armor of God. Wow. That's what we're learning about in men's Bible study. Impress it upon your kid. Why do we teach these things to our children? They have to know it. They have to know it to protect themselves, but also to make sure that they get to heaven. Because two things are going to happen when we die. Two things. You're going to heaven or you're going to hell. That's it. There's no other choice. No matter what the world says, that's it. <clears throat> Matthew 7, 24 through 25. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, this is Jesus, and puts them into practice, it is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it was built on a solid foundation. That's why we've got to teach our kids these things. That's why we have to teach other people. That's why we have to show other people. That solid foundation of faith is so important. It cannot be shooken. I hope that's right. I hope I said that one right. It cannot be shaken. Thank you. I'm P. I'm P. So we're talking about who we share our faith with. There's another very, very important scripture, and I, I'm getting to it. I'm going to read two versions of it. Proverbs 22, 6, the King James Version says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. The New International Version, which is the version I have, says start children off on the way they should go. Children are beginning their journey of life, right? So they're starting off. We've got to give them the education. We've got to give them what they need to start off on that life. Teach them about God. If you've ever been in the service or you've been a police officer or you've been a firefighter, you go through a lot of training. Just like it says there, King James, train up a child in the way that they should go. You go through a lot of training. Why do you go through a lot of training? Because when, when the bad times come, what do they tell you to fall back on? Fall back on your training. Don't fall back on a guess. Don't fall back on, an, on a hypothesis. Fall back on your training. So teach our kids now. Teach our kids young. Impress upon our kids to have faith, to trust in God. That way, when that devil starts tempting them, 
they fall back on it. They don't look at that beer. They don't look at that drug and say, well, maybe just a little bit. No, I'm not supposed to do this. I'm going to go on. I'm going to take off. Give them the, the basis, that solid rock they need. Train them so that they know. We not only share our faith with just our families, not just our church families, but with everybody. With everybody. First Thessalonians 5, 12 through 13. Now I ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. Verse 12, that's our giants. Those are our giants. Those are the people that have set us up on their shoulders. We ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord. There's your giants. Those are the people that work hard. That doesn't necessarily mean the people that organize the church, the ones that get up here and speak. That means the people that come and sit, you that sit and worship with us, those that make the snacks back there, those who make the coffee. That's an act of service to each and every one of us. Yes, it does include the ones who are in the forefront, but it's also those that come every Wednesday and sit and chime in and talk to us. Those are the giants. Those are the giants, the shoulders that we stand on. What does verse 13 tell us to do? Hold them in highest regard. Because of their work. What kind of work are they doing? They're doing the Lord's work. If they're sharing their faith with you and they're sharing the gospel in Christ, you're doing the Lord's work. You're a giant and you're sharing your work. We're to tell other people about Christ. Everybody. Everybody we see. We're to do it in a manner and with an attitude and a tone that is honorable to God. We're not supposed to beat them over the head with the Bible. Yes, there is some power in that. But that can't be the first thing you walk up to some sinner and tell them, hey, you're going to hell. We're all going to hell. It's those of us that get saved that aren't. Do it with love that Jesus did. We are to be like Jesus here on earth. One of my favorite TV shows is MASH. I love that TV show. And... uh Father Francis Mulcahy says you can't go wrong when you've got good when you've got good material. That's what it says on the bottom. Well, when you're talking about the Bible, that's the best material. There's a certain episode in uh, Mash that's toward the end. Uh, Mulcahy has the cardinal, big high up guy in the Catholic Church, is coming, and he, and Father Mulcahy wants to make a fantastic impression on him he wants to preach just like anybody that stood up here we would love to bring the message that ignites the next kentucky or the next thing that happened up there the next great awakening but father mulcahy he takes it a little bit a little bit too far he loses his humility he's at, he's after that pat on the back a little too much there's a patient in the hospital that's dying he's, he's going to die there's he can't get away from it but all that patient wants to do is help his buddy. He wants to help his buddy. Father McKay, he lost track of that. He was so worried about that pat on the back. So Father McKay stays with the guy. He's talking the whole night. And I think it was Klinger came and got him and said, hey, you know, you're, you're due. It's time to talk. Let's go. He jumps up. He runs in there. He's got his robe on, not the, the papal robe, but the the bed row, and he starts giving his sermon. And he's talking about the purpose. Why are we here? Father McKay says, God didn't put us here on earth. Now, this is weird coming from a writer of a TV show, but it still rings kind of true. <clears throat> he says, God didn't put us on this earth to achieve personal gain or notoriety or a pat on the back. God created us so that he could be here himself so that we could show others that he exists in our lives. We are to be the reflection of God here on earth. We are to show our faith and to show God. We are created in his image. We are to have the faith that he has, the faith that he entrusts in us and allows us to grow. 
We should accept his grace and his presence in our life. And then we should share that because that joy that we get from him is just too much to, to contain. We want to share it with others. Who you share your faith with is everyone. Who builds your faith is everyone. Sometimes we learn as much by bad examples as we do good examples. But don't go into the den of iniquity. Don't go into the den of iniquity. So in closing, you want to know if your faith is on the right track. Am I doing what I'm supposed to? In good times and bad times. Someone dies, someone is born. Everything's going wrong in life. Everything's going great in life. Do you want to know if your faith is going in the right direction? And I wish I could remember who gave me, who I didn't come up with this. I'm not smart enough. But I was smart enough to grab it and put it in the message. The question you can ask, is God your first line of defense or is he your last resort when all else fails? In good times or bad times, we turn to God, right? It doesn't matter. God should be our first line of defense. He shouldn't be the last thing we do when everything else fails. Have a relationship with God. Have a true and honest relationship with God, not just an arrangement. Be there at all times. Thank you so much.